When you hear the phrase Celtic Christianity, what do you think of? Probably a monk by the waterside, sitting by a tree, communing with nature in a place quite like this. Now, early Irish Christianity is a lot more conventional than most people realise. It doesn't seem to have been any more or less interested in nature than other parts of the Christian world at the time. And early Irish monks were likely to be more focused on books than on trees, and too busy with manual labour and the chanting of the Psalms to be lying back in the Beelowed Glade. The monks of this monastery, for example, collaborated to produce a very fine book of the Gospels in the 8th century, known as the Book of Mulling. And the founder of the monastery here, St. Mulling, was no anti-social hermit. He turns up in a historical source as a witness to a new law promulgated in the year 697, protecting non-combatants in times of war. But it can't be denied that of all the Irish saints, Mulling, as he is depicted in later biographies, is as close as you get to the nature-loving cliché. He's always singing songs, always tending to his patch of land next to the river Barrow, always looking after the animals around him. He's basically the Tom Bombadil of the early Irish church. One life of Mulling tells us that he was generous and mild with everyone, not just with humans, but with animals too. So when 30 hunting dogs get lost and end up here exhausted, Mulling gives them a special place to rest and feeds them. Each one of them, we're told, gets a loaf of bread with butter. He doesn't just feed domesticated dogs, but wild animals too. A fox was among his regular customers, but then one day this fox stole a hen from the monastery, ran off with it and ate it, and he was spotted by the monks. So Mulling reads him the riot act, and the fox slinks away. But then the fox has a bright idea. He goes over to the nun's church, steals a hen from them, and brings the hen back to Mulling. Now at this point, Mulling just smiles at the fox and tells him to bring the hen back to the nuns alive. Another time we're told Mulling saw a wren eat a fly. That horrified him enough. But then a cat ate the wren, which was just too much for Mulling. The saint commanded the cat to let the wren go. So he does, and the wren miraculously is still alive. Then the wren opens his little beak, and out comes the fly. Now, some of these stories are surely fantastical. But it's worth noting that in Christian countries where monasteries and hermitages are still found in wild areas today, similar things are reported, with wild animals gradually making friends with this non-violent human presence among them. But the significance of all these stories is clear, and the writer of Mulling's life makes it explicit. He says that Mulling cared for all kinds of animals in honour of their creator. In caring for dogs and foxes and wrens and flies, he was honouring the God who made dogs and foxes and wrens and flies. Even more than that, the peaceful interaction between Mulling and the environment around him is prophetic. It hints at a hope for future when there will be no violence, no enmity between creatures, when the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the fox will be friends with the hen.